good to be back. <laughs> so we're now moving our attention from, from the main street into, into kind of Wall Street. So in, in business schools we teach that we have Main Street, which kind of produces the innovations and the products and the services that this economy needs. And then we have the Wall Street, which kind of finances them. So kind of trying to figure out that which project, which ideas are good and which ideas are perhaps not that good. So uh, my, my fellow professors who are, who are also recently appointed, uh, they work in the kind of the main streets coming up with uh, new technologies to produce profitable products from uh, slag and CO2 and also quantum computers. But then I'm now moving on into kind of thinking about the investors. All right. So let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you are investors? Own stocks, mutual funds, bonds, anything, okay? About one half of the group, great. I can tell you that you're actually all investors, either directly, so if you raised your hand, or at least indirectly, by uh, being a member of the pension, pension system. So you're all in investors, okay? So what are we talking about? We're talking about, about half a trillion of wealth. So we collectively, as Finnish households, we have a wealth of about half a trillion. So most of it is in walls, okay? So that's something that Finns are very known for. That we, we like to invest in walls. We like to own our property, okay? But if you look at kind of all the small segments um, below real estate, you can see that there has been an increase in, in, in uh, especially in, in kind of this black sliver growing from basically non-existent portion of Finnish household wealth into being something uh, that is of meaningful value. So 53 billion, that's approximately the amount of uh, wealth we have collectively invested in stocks and mutual funds, okay? So the focus of this talk will be about this 53 billion. So in my research agenda, I try to address two very high level questions. So one is that who are the investors? So why did some of you raise their hand and why some of you didn't? Okay, so that's kind of the first, first question. The second one, which is sometimes even more interesting one, is that why do individuals choose some specific securities? So we can open a newspaper, we can look a listing of stocks or mutual funds, we can, be, uh, we can encounter a financial advisor who offers us a whole range of uh, financial products to, to choose from. So why do some investors pick, pick the stock of Nokia, but not the stock of Metso, and why does somebody else uh, do the other way around? Okay, so do we already have an answer? Okay, so the financial theory developed uh, in 1950s and 1960s kind of emerged as a, as a separate subfield from uh, economics, uh, and, and kind of they, they came up with a theoretical answer actually quite, quite early in the process. So at the heart of the financial theory, similar to uh, kind of neoclassical economics in general, is that there's optimal behavior. So individuals either, either uh, consciously or subconsciously try to optimize their behavior. This, this optimization of behavior applies to everything. So how much to work, how many children to get, which uh, occupation to, to, uh, to select, and, 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 and so forth. So similar in, 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 um, in finance, we, we also are interested in questions like how do we build a perfect portfolio? So how do we get the maximum amount of uh, expected return uh, with, um, with a certain uh, uh, risk limit or the other way around. So how do we minimize the risk of an investment portfolio uh, to a constraint where we require, say, 5% per, per year of uh, expected return? Okay, so 1950s and 60s, we actually, we, we do have an answer. So let's look at the data then. So if you, if you look at kind of Finnish individuals, how many financial assets they actually own, we're actually pretty far away from kind of the classical prediction. So the classic prediction from 1950s and uh, 60s theory would basically say that in investors should invest a small fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of their wealth in, in all securities, okay? So some of the securities would have a larger weight, obviously, but, but in theory, you should actually build an optimal uh, portfolio by considering all the assets in the world, okay? There are some shortcuts. Some of my colleagues who are here in the group uh, I probably now know this, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of shortcut here, but in, in reality there should definitely be more 
than and two or three uh, securities in a, in a portfolio. So this is actually quite low number. So there could be like a one equity fund and then there could be one bond fund, that's it. But still most of the individuals are kind of missing out a lot of diversification benefit. Okay? So, so why is it that we observe individuals having only two or three securities in their portfolio? Why don't they have like dozens of securities or, or even hundreds of securities to build like an optimal portfolio which, which well uh, diversifies the risk across geographies and, and, and asset classes? Okay? Now, choosing an optimal investment portfolio, it's actually a, quite a difficult task for an average individual. It's, it's quite a difficult task even for an MSc graduate in, in, in finance. So what do people do then when they're faced with an immensely difficult task? Uh, they resort to something called heuristics. So heuristic is, is a tool or a technique that when you're faced with a really difficult problem, you're trying to get to kind of a much simpler problem or much, much easier way of thinking about the problem. Okay? Your goals are getting the decision in a relatively short framework, and then you're hoping to make some kind of a good decision. You, you also usually realize that you're not making the optimal decision, but then you have to get kind of a good enough decision. Okay? So my, my kind of argument here is that individuals, they also shortlist securities. Okay? So they select their portfolio from a subset of securities, and this subset of securities uh, comes from somewhere. Okay? This problem or a way of making decision, it actually resembles decision making in other domains of life. So if you ask a five-year-old small boy or girl that, you know, what would they like to become when they grow up, they probably are not saying that, well, I'm going to optimize the, I'm going to optimize the, the, the wealth and the risk and my overall life happiness in my, in my occupation. But they probably say, that, well, I'm going to become a doctor or a fireman or, or something else. They probably have a list in their mind already. Okay? If you ask a 15-year-old person that, you know, what are you considering, what are you doing when you grow up, uh, the chances are that you're getting a result that I don't know and I don't care, okay? but then they might actually have a couple of ideas. But nobody's going to tell you that they're considering all the dif different options for their, um, uh, uh, for their occupation. Now, think about selecting a car. So somebody who's about to purchase a car they will never ever tell you that I'm considering all the models and makes simultaneous. They probably have a couple of uh, makes and a couple of models in their mind, and then they go pick uh, for, for their final solution. Then online dating application. So Tinder and the likes, that's basically shortlisting. So you have a long list of potential partners, and then you're shortlisting, and you're hoping that somebody is also shortlisting you, right? So this is also an example of shortlisting. Or going to a restaurant. Right? Um, so in some restaurants, uh, the most expensive ones, they typically have a very short menu. Okay? They want to help out people to make a good decision quickly. Okay? But then a lot of restaurants, they have a very long menu. And if you observe your peers or your friends or your colleagues or whoever making a decision, they will not consider all of the choices simultaneously. Okay? They will probably arrive at a couple of different uh, options really quickly, and then they will make their pick. Okay? So shortlisting is actually very, very common in, uh, in, in various domains of decision making. All right, so what led us to uh, study this type of shortlisting? So we, we made an empirical observation in the data. So, so what we have here is that uh, we, we sorted kind of investors and their parents uh, into groups. So we put them in the groups of one, uh, 100, so in, in the, in the de deciles, okay? So, so here on the, on the x-axis, uh, we have those, those fathers who have very high return on their investment portfolio. Okay? And then we kind of plotted the offspring's uh, returns in their investment pro portfolio. And we realized that there's actually quite substantial return. So if you're in the top 10% of, of parents being an investor and then versus the bottom 10%, then on average, your children's portfolios are going to yield uh, about 2% uh, uh, less uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a yield, okay? So quite a substantial, 2% of a year, you take the uh, compounded interest over decades, so there, there will be quite, a, quite substantial differences between various families, okay? 
And we thought that why is this the case? You know, you, you could immediately ask questions that is, is this that those people who are risk loving, they will have offspring who are risk loving, is it, or is it something else? Okay, and what we actually found was that this phenomena can be completely explained away by just when you're removing individual investments, which are exactly the same. So there, there seemed to be quite a lot of individuals in the data where kind of the parents and the children, they had exactly the same securities. Okay, or at least their portfolio had a substantial number of securities which were exactly the same. Okay, and then we started kind of wondering that why is this the case? We ran a couple of experiments and we found that it seems to be that parents are picking up investment ideas from their children and also the other way around. And by children here I mean children who are kind of at least 18 years of age who are kind of old enough to be uh, individual investors. Okay. So, uh, with the risk of kind of making this too, too colloquial, kind of the story we have in mind here is that when, when there's a kind of, you know, somebody in their late 20s or, or, or early 30s going to have a family dinner, and then, you know, their parents will ask that, well, you know, how's your life? You know, are you about to graduate soon? And, and you know, when are you go going to get a real job? And, 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 you know, when are you going to visit us more? And, and when are we going to get grandchildren? Then the children might say that, look, you know, let's not talk about this. Let's talk about something else. You know, let's talk about investments. You know, have you, have you, have you invested in, in, in this stock recently? Okay, this is what I'm investing in. Okay, so the story we have in mind is, is really that kind of these ideas for an investment, they have to come from somewhere. Okay, and this somewhere might as well be your family member, your peer, your colleague. They invest in something, they talk about that investment, okay? And there you get the idea and that enters you in, your, in your final choice set. So exactly the same way, so this is a menu from, uh, from, from actually this very building's uh, canteen, and there's meatballs on the list, okay? So there's all these choice available for you. So kind of putting the investment analogy in the, into kind of an analogy of making a lunch choice, so probably People who hang around with people who eat a lot of meatballs, then they will probably consider meatballs more likely when they're picking their lunch, right? They may, may not necessarily always go for the meatballs, uh, even if they're hanging around with people who eat meatballs, but at least it will be, be uh, more probable, okay? So then some conclusions. So conclusions worth of 53 billion euros, okay? So decision-making in the context of financial investments at least by household investment, it seems to be very, very much like decision making in, uh, in other contexts of life. So people seem to be kind of following very, very similar uh, style and, and, and techniques when they're making, uh, making decisions. Okay, so what can we learn and kind of why is this important and kind of what kind of questions we might be addressing in the future as well? Uh, it would be kind of really on the top of our agenda to understand that you know, who are kind of the most important reference groups. So we know already uh, from finance literature that family members, peers, colleagues, they have an impact, right? But then who are exactly the most, um, most, most relevant uh, uh, reference group in influencing investments? That's, that's something that we're, we're aiming to shed even more, more light in, in the future. And this is very important because we do see wealth clusters uh, in, in the data. So they, they are some, some clusters of individuals whose portfolios are yielding much more than the others. Their portfolios are extremely similar or even exactly the same. And then we will hope to understand like who are these clusters? Are they more, more likely to be clusters of colleagues or clusters of families or, or clusters of siblings or some geographical clusters or perhaps a combination of, uh, all, of, all, of the, all of the above? And, and why do we want to understand this kind of wealth formation and, and kind of the clusters? Well, wealth inequality, right? So, so we live in a society where some people are poorer, some people are richer, and then kind of as we grow the capital stock by, by uh, inventing uh, supercomputers and, and new innovative me methods for uh, uh, producing, um, uh, for producing uh, uh, products out from waste from steel process, then then we, we, we really need to kind of we really need to kind of understand uh, where, where is the wealth inequality um, coming from. Thank you. <laughs>